this country is at war with Germany. With Germany. We shall go on to the end. I remember the sheets of flame which came up and almost blinded us from our guns. Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. We do not think of armour being widely used in the Pacific campaign and compared to other theatres, that is a reasonable assumption. However, it was utilised by both the Japanese and the Americans from the island campaigns such as Tarawa and Guadalcanal through to the Philippines. Joining me today is Mike Gardia, who is the author of American Armour in the Pacific. I'm sure people will be more familiar with US armor, so I thought we should perhaps start with the uh, with the Japanese. You know, J- Japan's a, uh, a major power in the interwar years. It was at the top table when it came to the interwar naval treaties. Had it put much thought into tanks and uh, armored vehicles? They had, and it was pretty much a basic effort from the start. They were incredibly versatile in how they approached their armored formations. They knew that uh, they knew that they had to be light, they had to be mobile, and uh, they knew that in order to stay an expeditionary force, they had to rely on pretty much the modern-day equivalent of what we call a light tank. And uh, the Japanese were unique in modern militaries at the time because they developed and uh, maintained a vehicle called a tankette. So try to imagine something smaller than a light tank that's uh, that has enough armor protection basically to uh, stop a small arms bullet, but uh, will still provide a lot of mobility and a lot of direct fire support to a number of advancing infantrymen. Really, what they had done is they had taken their uh, they had taken their cues from a lot of the latter day allied reports from the first world war. And they said, okay, well, you know, studying the, uh, studying the early tank operations that happened in the trenches on the Western front in Europe, what can we do? How can we modify it? And how can we, uh, you know, make a machine that will duplicate similar results for us, but because we're going to be an expeditionary force, that's going to be uh, tethered to our Navy and try to project our land power onto Asia and onto the Pacific islands. How do we uh, create a machine that will be, very much armored, yet very much mobile to uh, achieve this shock effect that we want. Well, that sounds great as a broad concept, but but uh, you know the uh, what they ended up coming up with were these tanks like the Type eighty nine, the Type ninety seven, and whatnot. While uh, you know they they got the job done, they were just uh, you know mechanically, for lack of a better term, they were light years behind anything comparable to the Sherman or you know. It, anything that the West was putting out at the time. I think I have to subconsciously remind a lot of my readers that, you know, this was the days before Honda and Toyota were dominating the uh, dominating the automotive market, you know, Japanese automotive technology. If you look at who's building tanks in Britain, they, these are engineering firms who have a long established uh, experience in building, you know, uh, vehicles and trains and things to, to shift on to doing tanks. In Japan, you see, you know, Honda's not there. I mean, Mitsubishi must be there. But do they have a, a local engineer, heavy engineering uh, industry, industrial sector to even design and build these? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they did. I think one of the first companies to really jump into the four-way was what we n- now know today as Mitsubishi Industries. So that industrial basis was always there. It just, uh, you know, it wasn't of the caliber that you would see like later in the 70s and the 80s. I mean, we talk about the tank, the, the tankette, the type, is it 94, 97? That's the tankette, isn't it? The, the, the slight, the smaller, lightly armored tanks. Is the military saying, look, we want these because this is how it works? Or is it industry? Because I always get the feeling in, in, in Britain that, that some of the tank design becomes because... Uh, industry says we've got a tank and, the, and then the army goes, OK, what do we do with it? Uh, and then they design doctrine. Or, or is this the Japanese army d- driving the tankette design? Right. So it was really the Japanese high command and it was them, for lack of a better term, saying, OK, well, this is what we want. This is what we think it should be designed. So all the industry is here. Here is our specification for requirements see what you can do with this try and get us a try and get us a working prototype or design now could uh could the industry leaders 
satisfy the vague concepts that the military had at the time. Well, you know, that was largely a hit or, a hit or miss affair, but <laughs> yeah, it was, um, what, what was really the Japanese high command and their very, uh, very intensely driven Bushido warrior ethics that were, you know, that were driving the, were driving the industrial process at the time. It's interesting. You mentioned it being a, an, a, an expeditionary force. So they're not looking to design those, you know, mammoth, uh, tanks that the, say the British had coming out of the First World War, which would mean that the Japanese, presumably, the Japanese tanks see action in the in the thirties uh, in China. So it must presumably means they have some form of uh, actual field test uh, for real. They did. They did. So by the start of the nineteen thirties, you really had a shift in Japanese military thinking, where they were proactively trying to project their land power onto Asia proper. And, you know, you see this with a lot of the fighting that goes on on the Chinese mainland during the 1930s. So they did have field tests. And while, you know, you can point to some operational successes throughout any number of those battles, you know, like like uh, some of the skirmishes that they had against Russian troops and, uh, you know, even the uh, even the second Sino-Japanese War. It w- w- was really enough of a data bank for the Japanese to say, okay, well, we've seen how this works. We've seen enough successes, so let's keep on building it and uh, let's use it as a shock effect weapon. It might not be very capable of standing toe to toe against another tank, but you know, if we uh, if we can do a pile on effect and maybe swarm, uh, you know, formations from multiple angles, we can definitely get a leg up. Presumably, the Chinese didn't have many tanks, whereas the Russians, I mean, they've got two different opponents there. The Russians, it's, it's uh, Kalkin Gol that they get. The Russians beat them in the 39. Um, are they learning two different things? Or, or, or are these, or does this fighting basically uh, reinforce their thinking? Well, for the most part, it really reinforced their thinking. It was, you know, it was a um, practical lesson on many levels to say, okay, well, the tank, it's not perfect. How we're doing, it's not perfect, but we have at least enough data points to say, okay, well, let's keep this and let's keep refining it. And uh, let's, uh, let's push the industrial base that we have in the homeland to uh, keep making these things and also keep perfecting them. Do they have many tanks by the time of Pearl Harbor? Is it a large force? Uh, Not what I would call a large force. They have maybe half a dozen, probably half a dozen different designs that they're working with. They have a cadre that will at least be good for defending any one of the island outposts that they have. And I think one of the things that that, that the Japanese armor doctrine uh, lacked at that point was because by the time of Pearl Harbor, they pretty much knew that any engagement with the Americans in the Pacific was going to be uh, static warfare as far as uh, as far as the land engagements were concerned. So they had to use their tanks, not really as maneuver assets per se, but uh, for lack of a better term, armored pillboxes, you know, things that could provide a semi-static defense to any one of the island enclaves that they had. Yeah, it, 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 it will probably get to this later. It's interesting when you think about tanks in the Pacific because you haven't got those great European planes for them to sort of maneuver around. You know, it, It's a very different environment to try and deploy them. And not only that, you have to get them there. So it's not as if you can put them back on, on backs of trains or even drive themselves there. Uh, it, it takes a much more of a, a, a bigger effort to do anything with them, presumably. I was say, if we if we switch to the Americans and you're looking at that p- 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 Pacific theater, presumably the Americans, it's on their back door. The Americans have considered how they might fight in the Pacific if, if it came. And presumably uh, when you look at the Pacific, it, there's an expectation that the army probably going to be in the Philippines, but then, you know, say the Marines had to be deployed. Had thought been put into sort of a mobile tank to issue that might be a bit lighter for the Marines because they've got the same problems as the Japanese in, in shipping things around? That is actually an incredible credit to the Marine Corps at this time because – you know, you had a uh, you had a very long swath of time between the two world wars where you uh, saw tank development and tank tactics really come to a standstill. And uh, you know, it was it was thought that uh, it was thought that the type of warfare seen on the Western Front during World War Two, or excuse me, during World War One, uh, wasn't going to be 
played out in, in any future conflicts. And uh, a lot of the tank units were either disbanded or they were pretty much dissolved into the infantry. While that was happening a lot throughout the army, uh, the Marine Corps, for their part, they were of the mindset, OK, well, let's keep a viable study group together that will explore the feasibility of having an armored force be part of our expeditionary capabilities. Because if we have to establish a beachhead, one of the best ways to get through the enemy defenses on that beach is going to be to put an armored punch forward and be able to clear the way for a lot of our follow-on forces. So they really took a combined arms approach to say, okay, well, if we can prep the beach with artillery and naval gunfire and then use tanks as an asset to uh, clear it, you know, tanks and uh, amphibious armored assault vehicles, then that'll really give us a leg up. By the time we knew that the fascists were going to be a force to be reckoned with, well, we started to reevaluate our, our tank doctrines across both branches of the military, both the Army and the Marines, and to say, OK, well, we need a baseline armored cadre in both of our land based forces to try to stand toe to toe against what we might see against the Warmacht or the uh, or the IJA. So while the Marines were really setting forward the groundwork of what would be how to use tanks in an expeditionary role, you had the Army shake off its atrophy to say, okay, well, how can we do projected land warfare uh, using these armoured assets as part of a tank infantry team? So what are they going to war in the Pacific with predominantly in that, uh, you know, after that day of infamy in December 41? The tank force that we had, particularly in the Marine Corps at the time, was incredibly lean. You know, you had the uh, you had the M2 and you had the M3, which uh, were not much more than lightly armored motorized carriages. They had very small caliber main guns, and uh, while they uh, while they were capable of doing what a tank does, and they were capable of scoring some early victories against the Japanese, they were still very much behind the curve of uh, you know what uh, what tank design should have been throughout most of the modern world at that point. But all that started to change right around you know, the end of 1942 and going into 1943 when you had the M4 Sherman come online. Because, you know, and even though the Sherman wasn't quite up to par with uh, the tanks that you saw in the war mock, you know, like the Panzer IV or even the Tiger, it still was a tremendous leap forward in its armor protection, its firepower and its mobility. And you had the Sherman make uh, very short work of a lot of the Japanese tanks that it uh, saw throughout all those island campaigns. It's also the M3 Stuart, I guess, that opens up, as you, as you say, is the M2 uh, in, in the opening opening canvas. How did they compare to the uh, Japanese tanks that they're facing? So the M3 was also very steady in the face of enemy fire. It uh, it was um, it, it was it was certainly a leg up from the M2. It was the best tank that we could get at the time that could achieve parity with even some of the. Uh, even some of the lesser designs that the Japanese were making, but it really wasn't until the M4 came online that you really start to uh, see the unquestioned, unquestioned, undisputed dominance of American armor on the battlefield. The first armored clashes, I think, am I right in saying they take place in the Philippines? I mean, how how does this pan out? Because they're attacking, they're on the offensive. How are they using their tanks in the Philippines against the Americans? To, to the Japanese credit, when they invaded the Philippines, uh, they kept their tanks um, in what I can only call as part of a tank infantry team. And what they did was they really, they really took advantage of the shock effect and the low state of readiness that the American Philippine forces were in at the time. Because uh, they knew, as I'm sure many people throughout the Pacific knew, that taking uh, control of the Philippines was not going to be an impossible task. So what you had uh, when the uh, Japanese forces first landed at that uh, at those northern edges of Luzon, when they started their blitzkrieg to Manila, they were using their tanks and infantry in tandem, and uh, they were using their uh, they were using their tank forces as a uh, as you know both spearheads and as direct fire support weapons for for their infantry advances and it's weird because you see the americans have a role reversal at that point because you know you had a handful of m2 tanks that were scattered throughout the philippines and what they were used predominantly for at that point were you know static to mobile defenses because the because the uh, the american 
uh, for or, well, the Allied forces in general in the Philippines uh, found themselves in a position of defend, withdraw, defend, withdraw, and just try to uh, trade space for time and buy enough time for everyone to consolidate around Manila and uh, also the Bataan Peninsula. So you saw uh, the American tanks being used as what can only be said as a glorified delay tactic. We're going to try to uh, fire as much ammunition as we can against the Japanese and try to take out as many Japanese tanks before we fall back to another position, try to make a static defense there and just keep falling back. And uh, it's interesting because in in one of the follow-up books that I wrote, there's a, there's a book called The Combat Diaries, uh, one of the chapters is dedicated to the story of a veteran who was a POW um, in the Philippines. He tells the story of a tank that was part of his unit. He was actually with one of the National Guard tank units that got federalized and sent to the Philippines. Well, he said, you know, we got to a point where we didn't have any more ammunition left and we uh, we pretty much had to abandon our tanks and go off on foot. So once we fired our last round, we had to put a thermite grenade through the engine of the tank, you know, in order to disable it so that the Japanese couldn't salvage it and use her own weapons against us. And it's not long from the fall of the uh, Philippines, the Americans go on the offensive. So I wonder if when you're going on the offensive, and I think it's probably, it's, I might say it's um, Guadalcanal, have the Americans, and you know, specifically this, this is the, the Marines, though I, mean, I know the Army replaced them, put any thought into how you're going to get your tanks to your objective and then if if you're assaulting islands what are you going to do with them how do you get them off do they go in on the first waves i mean again this is you know these are writing real books that don't rules for books that don't exist because we haven't had dd and and sicily and things so what they do is they say okay well the tank is a very heavy weapon so we're going to have to accommodate for its tonnage Anywhere we take it. What they did, of course, you know, they were using you know, the troop carriers. They were using the cargo ships as, as uh, you know, as as part of the flotilla that they were using to storm any one of those islands. But uh, then you see the advent and really the widespread promulgation of these of these watercraft called L- LSTs, and uh, you know, it's a uh, it's really just a fancy acronym for a tactical landing craft. You know, kind of like what you would see at the beaches of Normandy, but much bigger. It's much bigger than a Higgins boat. It's a... Uh, That's landing, landing ship tank. Right. It w- would be enough to accommodate the tonnage of you know of a handful of tanks, at least. And it would hit the beach. It would be, it would be designed with enough buoyancy to uh, hit the beach without essentially running aground. And then the front ramp would drop or it would open up. And, uh, you know, off would roll the tank and that tank would be responsible for, you know, firing the uh, firing the opening barrages of what, what would be the battle to take the beachhead. So once you have the tank rolling across that beach, you know, then you also have to keep in mind the terrain, you know, because you have a very heavy track vehicle. Well, not every place on a Pacific island, particularly if it's uh, an island made of volcanic vent, uh, ash, is going to be uh, is going to be suitable for the trafficability of track vehicles, so that's where you have your intelligence section come in. And for their part, what they do is they say, okay, you know, based on our topographical analysis of the island, we say that okay, you know, under these weather conditions, these parts of the island are going to be the most conducive to supporting track vehicles, and try and stay away from this part of the island because it may look solid, like, like solid terrain, but it's actually a marsh. And uh, that would then factor into the operational planning for all of the all of the maneuver leaders at that point saying, OK, well, based on where we think the enemy is, we're going to have a uh, flanking tank formation go to this part of the island. They're going to lay down a base of fire or they're going to provide covering fire, just trying to use tanks in a matter that supports the overall operation, but still keeping in mind what pieces of terrain they can and can't go off of. Have they thought of all this pre-war or are they literally making it up as they go along? It was part of their baseline planning all along. But when they actually got closer and closer to the battle, they said, okay, well, everything that we had factored into a lot of the expeditionary warfare tactics, you know, now it's time to actually put it into use. So, you know, let's take a uh, solid analysis of what we know of the island. What does aerial reconnaissance tell us? What can we what can we get from the you know what can we get from the intel cell as it is to 
have a workable plan. And, uh, you know, not only that, to keep in mind that no plan is going to survive first contact. So, <laughs> so let, let's rely on good crew training and good crew initiative to uh, just try and find the best and most suitable pieces of land that we can. Yeah. And they're supported that they, 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 I mean, they have the uh, LVTs is the alligator and the buffalo supporting them. These, I mean, we can probably class these as armored vehicles as well, can't we? Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, we sure can. The LVTs, uh, you know, were you know pretty much the predecessor to the more modern day Marine Corps, what would identify as an Amtrak. It was an incredibly versatile vehicle that was uh, very well suited for the mission of the time. Well, d- describe that because I think most people think when they think of, of landings, I mean, w- the Higgins boat is is the is the be all and end all certainly in in movie depictions of beach landings. But the alligators and the, these buffaloes, these LVTs, uh, actually, when you look at photographs from the time, there's loads of them, isn't there? They 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 I don't know how much of the heavy lifting they actually do, but. Yeah, how big are they? What 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 was their function? How are they armored? Let's see. They were, if I can make a size comparison, they're probably equivalent uh, in size to where if you were to take four full size sedans and uh, put and stack them two by two together, two squared by two squared, it would probably be uh, it would probably be comparable in size to that. Try to imagine something comparable to a bulldozer, like a caterpillar bulldozer, but without the blade and uh, without the rooftop. And uh, both sides of the caterpillar treads are covered, and you have a you have a sloping apparatus upwards that provides some armor protection with a machine gun mounted on top. For as simple as it sounds, it's incredibly effective for, you know, getting troops um, onto the beachhead, getting them onto the battlefield while laying down some suppressive fire. And, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot to be said for the psychological impact that it has as well, because, you know, you, you're uh, say, say you're a Japanese defender. You haven't seen anything like this before. And uh, it's a uh, it's a curious object. And, you know, you're firing everything you can at it, but it's not slowing the machine down at all. <laughs> they were much bigger than I thought they were. I thought they were quite small things. And actually, they're, they're huge. <laughs> the photographs, the photographs uh, don't do them justice. Were they developed before the war? Because I know the Higgins boats was the designs kicking around as the uh, you know in the late thirties, but it, it only comes to fruition once the war started. Are these LVTs had they started those pre-war, or did they come on stream as they needed? Especially in the case of the alligator and the LVT, you know, it was um, it was something that was decidedly pre-war, and it was uh, it was almost ironic because it uh, was originally conceived as a humanitarian assistance vehicle. It was something that, you know, was supposed to, you know, help with, uh, you know, swamp rescue efforts. It was a vehicle that could help get access to parts of the country that were much harder to get to, you know, say like the swamps in Florida or, you know, just any part of uh, any part of a wildlife reserve where you needed to get help to someone Quick, fast, and in a hurry. And yet here you have, uh, however many years later, when the war starts, it's being used for the exact opposite of what its designer had intended. So how do they operate? Are they How do tanks operate? Are they attached to infantry or are they operating in their uh, as their own units? So uh, really it depended on what formation that you were going into battle with um what the army was doing um by and large where they were uh, you know they were having a combined arms team a tank infantry team where you uh you had the infantrymen and the tanks pretty much working side by side as a as a combined arms unit and the marines did do that as well to a large extent but then other times you would have separate tank companies assigned to their own mission and uh, they would be it would be responsible for pacifying a a particular sector of the beach or, you know, knocking out a a specified enemy stronghold. But uh, where you really saw the most, uh, the most effective use of armor was when uh, they were part of those tank infantry teams, because you could have a, uh, you could have a separate tank battalion either in uh, the army or the Marine Corps. And then one company would get attached to an infantry battalion or even a tank section would get attached to an infantry company and they would be working in tandem to uh, you know, either lay down suppressive fire, like the infantry might lay down suppressive fire, and then the tanks would be the maneuver element, or the tanks would lay down a base of fire, and then the infantry would be the maneuver element. Did the Japanese have any anti-tank 
capability. You know, if they see the infantry, infantry moving in, the infantry calling in tanks to support them. Does the Japanese uh, army have any anti-tank weapons to deploy? They had a number of anti-tank weapons. They had, uh, you know, some towed anti-tank guns, things comparable today to what we would call a recoilless rifle. They were effective when they could get off a clear line of sight and immobilize a tank in any form or fashion. But, you know, it was uh, it was always a question of the victor being who could see first, who could shoot first and who could conceal themselves first. I wasn't sure how quite how effective. I mean, was that a, a quite effective work? Because actually, the Sherman's quite presumably the, in the theater, in the Pacific theater. The Sherman, whilst it's not a heavy tank, must have been a pretty heavy tank. So I don't know how susceptible that was to Japanese anti tank weapons. It was it was more resilient than a lot of its predecessors were. And uh, what a lot of crews ended up doing is uh, they would they would have some uh, some add on armor. That they would put on to the uh, to the sides and the uh, and and the front slope of the tank, and uh, they would also do what they could to reinforce the back of it. It was really ingenuity at its finest because you know you had these different uh, you had these different pieces of uh, you know Johnny on the spot slat armor that were quite effective at not necessarily not necessarily stopping the anti tank round. It would just take the brunt of the impact and. The tank would be rattled, of course, but it wouldn't be disabled. And, uh, you know, the, the crew could still continue to fight in the vehicle, you know, despite having uh, despite having been rocked by an anti-tank round. Tarawa, the American, the U.S. Marine Corps, conclude that the M3 Stuarts are not are inadequate for sta- sustained combat, which quite surprised me in some respects because you know, they're still only fighting against tankettes. So they're still, you know, a pretty capable vehicle. Why does the Marine Corps turn against the M3? It's really not for lack of appreciation or confidence in the vehicle. It's uh, just for, you know, the sake of, well, we really want to take crew survivability to the next level. The M3 took us as far as it could with the capabilities that it had. But, you know, now that the M4 is online, it's it, it was really just a question of, well, we need to uh, put our best foot forward against the Japanese. And, uh, and the more crewmen we can get inside the M4, really the better. Yeah, you know, I mean, of course, they were still using the M3 all the way to the end of the war, in fact. But it, it, at that point became a question of, OK, well, we know that the Army has priority consideration for all of the uh, all of the great toys and tools that uh, are available to them. So once we work our way through the hand-me-downs, then we're going to you know, grab as many of these M4s as we can. When you're bringing all these tanks into theater, you know, you, it's already it's all well and good designing them in, in the U.S., where you know what the weather's going to be like, but you know, do they need to be adapted to fight in in these you know hot tropical damp sort of conditions? They do, as a matter of fact, because uh, one of the things that American forces had experimented with was making the tanks amphibious, because the planners in the War Department said, okay, well, you know, if we only have so many LSTs to go around, uh, could we presumably do things more efficiently if we could adapt certain tanks to be amphibious and to accomplish that end, you know, they would fit tanks with these snorkels. They would fit them with, uh, you know, these very crude flotation devices. And I have a few pictures of that in the book. The results were mixed, but when they did work, they worked pretty effectively. I mean, you know, it, it's a, it's a curious thing to see a uh, tank with a snorkel and uh, what can only be described as a very crude propeller apparatus making a beeline dash through the surf onto the beach. But, uh, you know, you do get that added benefit of, okay, well, you know, you're not necessarily on a stable platform, but the main gun can still fire from the surf. You might not get a lot of accuracy, but, you know, you'll get around going in in the general direction of the enemy and it'll be enough to at least, uh, it'll be enough to get their attention and keep their heads down. Yeah, you get those big snorkels coming off the back, don't you? Those big curving exhaust things and the first time you look at you think what the hell is that and it, it you know it's for drive, driving through uh water i have to say it always struck me as uh, i never would want to be any form of tank that had anything to do with being meant to float you know tanks are always struck me as being a bit like stones they tend to go down in water rather than bob along like a piece of wood it would be absolutely you know scare me witless um 
And they do start fitting flamethrowers to tanks in the Pacific. You, you, I'm not quite sure where in the campaign, but they do. But how did that come about? Was that uh, uh, an ad hoc procedure that someone dreamt up in field, or they um, was that, you know, or were they already in the armory? We had been using flamethrowers as early as the First World War, and as the war with Japan got underway, they said, "Okay, well." the inherent liability that we have with a with a soldier mounted flamethrower is that he becomes a uh, he becomes a liability on the battlefield and he becomes a target for enemy snipers because you know you know where the flamethrower is and you know that one well placed bullet to the uh, flame tank that he has in his backpack will not only uh, not only incinerate him but uh, quite a few of his buddies who are like anywhere within a 10 to 15 meter radius of him so I said, okay, well, if we can take that same concept and add armor protection to it, we'll get the same effect as a soldier-mounted flamethrower, but we'll have it on a mobile platform that's armored and is much less susceptible to being damaged by any type of enemy ordnance. And really what the thinking was there at the time was that, you know, hey, uh, the Japanese are, are hedgehogging inside any one of these islands across the Pacific they're going to be engaging us mostly from bunkers. So to get an effective bunker buster, let's put a flamethrower in this tank that can not only take care of troops out in the open, but you can use the flamethrower apparatus to squirt flame inside the in, in, inside the vision slits of any one of those uh, bunkers and field houses that will turn every Japanese soldier in there, you know, into a uh, charred flesh. It will not only neutralize that threat but it'll have an intense psychological shock effect on uh, any number of japanese it's like you know what what could be scarier than a tank that is also a flamethrower we're going to take a short break we'll be back with you in a moment welcome back we're discussing american armor in the pacific i get a feeling that the on, on the islands on these island hopping campaigns the tanks tend to be used more as sort of uh bunker busters rather than any sort of tank on tank warfare presumably because the japanese didn't necessarily have tanks on all the islands oh yeah yeah and and as a matter of fact you know having a tank as a bunker buster was really its primary role you know they uh they knew that it was uh, they knew that if they did see heavy combat the heaviest combat would be against enemy bunkers because those were the enemy strongholds you know you might uh you might get sporadic fire you know some some harassing fire from ground troops you may get one well-placed round from a recoilless rifle, but uh, most of the energy is going to be exerted against bunkers. Now, of course, as you get closer to the Japanese mainland, you know, they're going to have a lot more tanks at their disposal because, you know, that's where most of the heavy defenses are going to be. You know, it's like because once you get to that main Japanese archipelago, you know, they're you know, they're going to be defending that tooth and nail. In which case, as the, the start of the campaign you know, in the Philippines, when the Americans start the Philippines, their uh, invasion of the Philippines, do we once more get uh, actually more tank-on-tank combat that you might think of, say, in the European theatre? Uh, how does that work out? Are they are both sides doing <laughs> different things than you might find in Europe? Right. Yeah, so really the big tank-on-tank battles um, start to happen as you get later into the war. You start to see a lot of that happen in the Philippines, also in places like Okinawa. You know, th- That's where it's become pretty clear to, I think, any sentient Japanese soldier at that point that they're really just trading space for time. And, uh, you know, they they don't have a lot left to throw at the incoming Allied forces. So that's where you start to see, uh, that's where you start to see a lot of the tank on tank battles. But, you know, when you take a bird's eye view of it, you really see that, uh, you know, it's happening differently in Europe, because, you know, here and even in places like Okinawa, you know, you only have so much maneuver room and you only have so much space to actually deploy your formations. Whereas you see throughout most of Europe, it's these battles that happen between tanks at the company and at the battalion level. It really becomes a uh, platoon on platoon style fight throughout the latter stages of the Pacific. I mean, the uh, it's much more close quarters combat and it's much more tank sections on tank sections as opposed to, you know, maybe one or two echelons up where you see a, a lot of those battles happening. How do the Japanese fare in these you know, slightly larger scale tank on tank actions towards the end of the war? They re- really don't fare all that well. And I think it's, it's largely a function 
not only of the quality of their equipment, because, you know, you had the Type 89 and the Type 97, you know, both of which were incredibly inferior to anything that the Americans were were throwing at them. But, you know, you also had an atrophy of uh, you had an atrophy of skill because of what a lot of these tank crews had done since the early 30s, you know, they hadn't really been in any tank on tank fights in uh, a long time at that point. And, you know, even after the Japanese had uh, essentially conquered the Pacific, they had just been sitting in, uh, they had been sitting in defensive positions for a long time. So their, uh, their crew, I think the crew synchronicity had started to atrophy and uh, they didn't have as many opportunities to engage in combat and, you know, learn on the fly and, you know, make all those big metaphysical connections and, and uh, really be an effective fighting crew by the time, you know, it was, uh, it was coming down to the wire for places like Okinawa and the Philippines. It's funny because they'd obviously put the thought into how the tank had worked for them, yet once they'd decided on that, they, it's almost like they've kind of moved on from their worrying about how to tactically or even strategically use the tank in the Pacific. And it kind of, the emphasis seems to be on the, you know, the, the infantry man being central, you know, the importance of uh, elan and personal prestige and that warrior code kind of thing, as opposed to being in a tank, which makes you wonder if there's something culturally, I don't know, that doesn't work for them with tanks. It's kind of tragically ironic because, you know, they started off uh, uh, strong going in depth with a lot of their doctrines and their, and their tactics and, you know, trying to uh, see what worked and trying to see what didn't work. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, when uh, they realized, OK, well, we're trading space for time. Let's just take what we have and let's try to make some good use of it. But, you know, because tanks require a lot of maintenance and, you know, spare parts, we're getting in shorter supply. They're like, oh, well, OK, you know, let's rely on something we know doesn't require a lot of maintenance. And but that's our foot soldiers. You know? Yeah. And half the time they couldn't even get the food to to the islands to feed them. So never mind tank parts, petrol, you know, oil, uh, all, all of the extra bits. You have a logistical problem, uh, I guess, with, with those vehicles. Yeah, very good. So excellent. So uh, you mentioned Combat Diaries. Tell me about Combat Diaries, which is that your last World War Two book to be Oh, no, you've got was that the last World War Two book to be out. Yes. Uh, so let's see, that was the last pure World War Two book. And the Combat Diaries is a is a collection of true stories from the front lines of World War II. And what you have is each chapter is an individual story of a particular veteran who fought on the front lines uh, across all branches of service, Army, our Army, Navy, um, what was at the time the U.S. Army, Air Forces, and the Marine Corps. And... You know, throughout every one of those chapters, it is following the life of that individual troop and, you know, what he, uh, you know, what he did on the front lines, how he came to join the military. The overall theme of the book is that, you know, here were these men who came from uh, an incredibly diverse set of backgrounds. They came from every walk of life, and yet they rose to the challenge to fight the Axis powers when their country called for them. And, uh, you know, these were ordinary guys, and there was nothing uniquely remarkable in their background that would have suggested that they would rise to a lot of these heroic feats and yet they they defied the odds and uh when the when the chips were down and the odds were stacked against them they they performed some feats of human strength that can only be described as miracles Mm. and were you into interviewing veterans i interviewed a handful of them yes yes i sure did do you have a favorite story Let's see. You know, if I can pinpoint a favorite, it's probably going to be chapter one. No, I'll actually have two favorites. Um, Chapter one and chapter two of the book. Chapter one, you have the story of a man named Bill Smith, who was the first man ashore on Omaha Beach's Red Sector. He he was uh, he was an army uh, forward artillery observer. He was calling gunfire into um, into Normandy Beach hours before the first wave of troops arrived, you know, to, uh, to, to attack the, to attack the Nazi defenses there. And, you know, it's a favorite of mine because, you know, he provides in such exquisite detail, everything that he was doing, you know, here was, you know, at least a good five to six hours before the invasion, it was the pre-dawn hours. And, you know, he's, he's riding alongside these rubber dinghies, you know, with, with maybe frogmen 
you know, he's he's able to wade ashore, you know, completely undetected by the Nazis and and, and take up a hiding position where he's calling in uh, where, where, where he's calling in gunfire onto the beaches. And, you know, just watching all of these uh, German fortifications explode, you know, it was a hair raising adventure for him because he said that as soon as the first rounds started to land on the German defenses, the Germans activated their searchlights and they were scanning the beaches because they said, OK, if we're getting allied gunfire that th- that is this accurate, there has to be a spotter somewhere on the beach. <laughs> They said I was hiding underneath a pile of rocks and, you know, the lights, you know, crossed over me several times, but they never detected that I was there. And it's also a favorite of mine because he has had so many naysayers in the ensuing years ever since he told that story. People who doubt the veracity of it and, uh, you know, people who said, oh, well, no, there's no way that you could have been the first guy on the beach. But, you know, he systematically destroys, you know, every one of their arguments because, you know, hey, he was there. He um, is able to, uh, you know, he's able to shoot down any one of their pieces of ignorance from, you know, these armchair warriors who think they know how it happened, but but they weren't there to see it. And then the other favorite that I have is chapter two, and it's the story of of a man by the name of Marty Romano, and he was the son of Italian immigrants. You know, he grew up in, uh, you know, he 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 grew up in New England. He's he's, he's from Jersey City. Originally, you know, it was just a, uh, you know, it was just one of those streetwise kids who ended up joining. He ended up serving in the Navy and he wasn't quite sure what he wanted to do aside from being a machinist. But then he discovered this newfangled thing that was called a PT boat. And he's like, wow, what is that? That's not a uh, it's it's too small to be a destroyer, but it's too big to be a gunboat. Now, this PT boat is it sounds pretty cool. And of course, a lot of people know the PT boats, you know, from John F. Kennedy and the PT-109. Well, uh, it, it's uh, it's a lesser celebrated part of American naval history that PT boats actually were, uh, you know, were quite operational th- through uh, throughout the Mediterranean theater uh, in the war. He was assigned as a crew member to a PT boat that was out there. It, it was PT 306. And, you know, just the incredibly hair raising stories that he had to tell. And this is my favorite because I actually got to interview uh, Marty at, at length before he passed away. And, you know, he would do all these night patrols in the Mediterranean, you know, trying to hunt for um, these Italian Navy boats and these uh, Kriegs Marine boats and just the incredible variety and also the diversity in the mission sets that he has, because not only was he doing these hunter killer missions, he was also a taxi service for the OSS because he would have these OSS spies. He would drop them off at the coastline. And as he would drop off one set of OSS spies, they would rendezvous with another set of OSS spies who were just completing their mission. They would jump on the PT boat and then he would take them back to the allied headquarters. That was like on Sardinia. (laughs) And I mean, it was, it was, uh, it was incredible because it was like half naval warfare, half James Bond stuff that he was doing. I was Bill Smith's story is incredible. I talked to a a, a chap who just had been interviewing a, uh, frogman and as you say you think of uh the opening hour opening opening of uh the d-day landings as being that sort of saving private ryan and actually there's been people creeping about those beaches clearing in roads of explosives and doing various other things uh and those frogmen for going in beforehand clearing explosives you said that the forward observers I mean, why would they not be forward observers you know to, to you know guiding things as, as they happened absolutely incredible hollywood's hollywood portrays a different picture so you don't get that idea that you just get sort of this blind confusion of those Higgins boats landed uh, 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 saving Private Ryan scene. What a fantastic story. How on earth did he get himself that job? Did he volunteer or is he just kind of uh, pushed into it? He had joined as an artillery officer and, uh, you know, pre- pretty much by virtue of being a young lieutenant, he was already in the forward observer role. You know, he was, uh, you know, he was going forward with these, with all of these maneuver formations, um, trying to coordinate artillery fire at the front lines. And uh, because his particular unit had been identified as the first wave that was going into D-Day, he was pretty much voluntold. He's like, okay, where is our forward observer? Oh, there you are. Here's your mission. You're going to go in to this little rubber boat. You're going to, you know, be accompanying, you know, a lot of these demolitionists and frogmen. And uh, you're going to uh, be very quiet. And whatever you do, don't lose the radio because a lieutenant can be replaced, but a radio cannot. Yeah, well, an incredible story. Incredible story. Um, we seem to have strayed from um, Armour in the Pacific, so perhaps we should uh, leave it there. Thanks, Mike. 
Loyal listener, Mike's book is American Armour in the Pacific. And if you are interested in hearing first-hand accounts, the other book we touched upon was The Combat Diaries, True Stories from the Front Lines of World War II. And don't forget, if you have enjoyed this podcast, you can become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash ww2podcast. It's a big thank you to those of you who are patrons. It really helps me find the time to put the show together. So that's patreon.com slash ww2 podcast. Well, that is all from me for now. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening. Jerry, 88 millimeter gun hit our tongue, blew us the hell out of it. The hell out of it. The hell out of it. Darling, that can never be repaired. Be repaired. As Allied Commander-in-Chief, I have granted a military armistice.